This is Duke University. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back, black. Welcome to Left of Black, I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by Professor Shana L. Redman, author of the new book, Anthem, Social Movements and the Sound of Solidarity in the African Diaspora, published by New York University Press. How are you doing today, Professor Redman? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? I'm great. Uh, this is a fabulous book, um, you know, and, and not only because we share editors and Eric Zinner at NYU Press, um, but it really does give a kind of great history of the role of anthems in African American music, obviously, and, and and you know some of the chapters that you focus in on really give us a deeper and more intense view of how these songs have functioned, particularly in Black political culture. Uh, talk a little bit about the genesis of the book, if you will. Well, the uh, genesis of the book really began with my personal investment in trying to sustain myself um, as a first-generation college graduate and certainly first-generation graduate student. I was looking for a project that I could live with and that would uh, make me happy, but also would be able to merge my interests. And having been a former singer and being invested in social justice and political action, I was wanting to figure out how best to merge those two interests and investments. And it just so happens that um, my second year in the graduate program at Yale, I was in the Beinecke Library and found the correspondence that ended up being the foundation for chapter two mm -hmm. between James Weldon Johnson and Yasuichi Hakita. And Hakita was asking permission to translate Lift Every Voice and Sing into Japanese. And it really uh, set off a light bulb in my head, um, thinking about how songs become strategies of resistance and what that might mean for intra-racial and interracial political collaborations. And so that was the genesis. And I'm thankful for that library visit and the funding <laughs> that brought me there. Um, but then also for the, the guidance that I received from um, peer mentors and my uh, committee for encouraging me to think about this as its own genre. There are so many folks when they hear Lift Every Voice and Sing, I mean, the only thing they know about it is that it's the quote-unquote Negro National Anthem, right. literally an anthem. Um, they don't know much about James Weldon Johnson. Um, they don't know much about his brother, you know, Rosamund. And what you do here is really put the song in such a broader context. I mean, I was actually floored by the idea that someone wanted to translate the song <laughs> into Japanese. There's a way in which we think about these Negro anthems, if you will, as they would have been thought of, uh, you know, say 70 or 80 years ago, as things that are so localized, that are so tied to a Black Southern experience. But part of what you showed throughout this book is that many of these songs, you know, not only have a kind of cosmopolitan sensibility to them, I mean, they're really produced by cosmopolitan people, people who have such a broader view of how these songs should function, not just in African-American life, but really in a kind of a global context. So if you could talk a little bit more about particularly this relationship between James Weldon Johnson and Lift Every Voice and Sing and, and, and this Japanese, you know, guy who's interested in having the song translated. Absolutely. I mean, I think um, one of the shortcomings of some of our literatures um, in, in Black studies has been our um, lack of clarity and pre precision around mm -hmm. thinking through these figures, as you're saying, as already cosmopolitan, right? And James Walden Johnson is a perfect example of that, having worked as consul to Venezuela and Nicaragua um, while he was writing Autobiography of an Ex-Colored oh, Man yeah, in 1912. Right. So long before he um, becomes kind of this patriarch of the NAACP, he's already engaging politically um, in formal politi a formal political sense, but thinking globally about his work, writing about Haiti and the occupation in 1915, right? All of these things that are already engaging him in broader uh, struggles, um, both as kind of practice and philosophy. Um, and, you know, I think it's it's been an under an underdeveloped element of the receptions to Black Studies literatures, not the literature itself so much as its reception. Right, already thinking Black people as global citizens, um, but I think that looking at the music that's produced between these communities and that's shared gives us 
um, a, a really unique sense of how that materialized and how these communities began to speak to each other, how they shared items, how they shared ideas, how they shared in struggle and identified with one another, even at these moments of tense kind of uh, political battles, right? So this exchange between Hakita and Johnson is happening during the Depression, but just at the uh, doorstep of World War II is when it really takes off and the anthem is translated and published in Japan. And so you have this moment of uh, incredible tension, right, between nations on a global scale, and yet you see this transfer that's happening, this translation, this act of translation that's being worked out between these communities as an effort to actually solidify bonds that they had long discussed and believed to exist. So the, the anthem genre, I think, does a lot of work for helping us to think through how Black people are positioned globally, how culture is used as a mechanism of camaraderie and a strategy of resistance. You're watching Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony. We're joined by Professor Shana L. Redmond, author of the new book, Anthem, Social Movements and the Sound of Solidarity in the African Diaspora, new book, New York University Press. You know, we just celebrated the King holiday. And literally, there were probably thousands of Martin Luther King breakfasts uh, that occurred across the nation. And, and, and we could probably speculate that a good 75 percent of them, at some point, everyone in the room grabbed hands with someone next to them and they sang, We Shall Overcome. Uh, it's the kind of song that, you know, when I was in college, I, I had become almost numb to because of the way that it got recalled over and over again. And, and we very rarely, because it was so tethered to King's version of, of the civil rights movement, it was also something that we never thought of as having any radical context. Uh, what you do in this book, What We Shall Overcome, is actually to show the song as something that had deep radical roots, particularly in terms of the labor movement, that largely gets forgotten when the song is recalled you know, much later in the 21st century. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wasn't excited to look at We Shall Overcome, honestly, <laughs> for that same reason. You know, I just don't think the history that we know of it gives us um, any sense of, it, of its depth, but right. certainly no sense of its dynamism, right, and its genesis. And so when I initially um, began looking at it, it was um, it was laborious, right? Because I expected to find the story that I had already been told, which was not its story or its genesis at all. Um, so, in doing the research for that chapter, I found that much of the literature on the song was actually wrong. So, even if the song is situated in the literature as a labor ballad or a labor anthem, it's often attributed to an AFL union, right, right, uh, an American right. Federation of Labor Union, which was segregated when in fact the song arose out of a Congress of Industrial Organizations union, a CIO integrated union um, in the South, right? So an integrated union in the South in the mid 1940s and a union that was overwhelmingly led by black women, right? right? So that is not the story that we know of We Shall Overcome. Right. And so once I finally got into the work of it and was tracing this narrative through the strike itself at American Tobacco Company, I found a radically different story than the one that I had been taught and fed as a young person. And it's a much more encouraging, a mu much more uh, dynamic and glorious story than any that I think young people are told today. You know, do we do a disservice, and, 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 and by that I don't mean us necessarily, but there's a way in which, you know, the way that these narratives of the civil rights movement and, of course, these anthems, these songs are presented to young folks, that they really have no sense of the deeper context of them, right? Um, we could be talking about work songs in the context of, uh, of, of, you know, African enslavement and plantations. I mean, I mean, they really have no sense of the kind of function of those songs, how important it was to sing them, particularly as a group in a congregation, in public forums. Uh, you know, what do you think are some of the reasons why these songs kind of get forgetting and forgotten to us in those contexts? Well, I mean, one of the problems, I think, and something that I gesture towards in the conclusion of the book is that these songs become institutionalized. And that's mm -hmm. part of the mm -hmm. definition that I use of anthem, right? It's a song that becomes part and parcel of an organizational history. And I think once those organizations fade from our view, right, once they cease to mobilize, once they cease to be kind of prime actors in struggle, the songs seem dated immediately, 
right? Because there's right. no energy, there's no performance behind them. There's that's no movement right. to political struggle. Right. So I think that that's a big part of it. Um, but I also think that there are ways in which they become so um, defined by a particular political context that once those have passed, we see them as passe. And I think We Shall Overcome is a perfect example of that. So in the conclusion, I talk some about the backlash to We Shall Overcome, even in the 1960s by people like Malcolm X, right, um, who's talking about revolution. And he uh, chastises men for instead of protecting women like Fannie Lou Hamer as he's sitting on the dais with her in Harlem, he says, instead of protecting these women, we're sitting around singing We Shall Overcome, right? And very disdainful of the song and its performance, right? Um, which I want to trouble through the chapter, through doing the work of what the song actually did in, in its strike, in its moment. But I do think there's a, a way in which these songs are so identified by a certain political context that sometimes it's hard to um, see them as historically dynamic, to see them as something that can be adopted and resurrected later on. But again, in the conclusion, I talk some about the ways in which these anthems all have lives beyond the institutions that birthed them, whether they show up it as a sample in hip hop or whether or not they're adopted by other global movements. For example, Ethiopia, the original anthem of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, gets translated and used as one of the primary uh, sonic texts of the Rastafarian movement in the 1930s, after the Garvey movement has kind of faded from view. So I think that these songs, if we listen closely enough, do have lives and continue to remain important to communities globally. But it's hard to recognize that when we want to historicize them, when we want to concretize them in one moment. And that's part of the dynamism of music, as you know and have written about, right, is that it can't be so easily um, pigeonholed, right, or, or stayed. It's, at, it's a continually moving engagement. You're watching Left of Black. We're joined today by Professor Shana L. Redmond, the author of the new book, Anthem, Social Movements and the Sound of Solidarity in the African Diaspora, published by New York University Press. Um, Shana, I'm a little older than you are, um, <laughs> but have vivid memories as a three or four year old literally being forced to listen to Young, Gifted and Black. You know, if there was a Head Start graduation or a kindergarten graduation with a room full of Negroes, at some point, you know, we were going to hear some version of Young, Gifted, and Black, whether it was it. Nina Simone's original, uh, whether it was Aretha Franklin's version of it, uh, the Donny Hathaway live version of it, which, you know, in, in many ways is, is my favorite version of it. Talk a little bit about the significance of this song uh, and, and also about what it meant to a particular generation of folks, you know, who are on that cusp, that cutting edge of whatever tomorrow was going to be, um, to be almost... Uh, you know, shielded from whatever the dangers of that by being able to recall a song that really gave, supported the notion that it was important to be young, gifted, and black in that particular historical moment. Right. Um, well, I think that, you know, this song is really um, incredibly dynamic. And I wish that I had had those types of performative opportunities as a three <laughs> or four year old. I need to check those out. Um, <laughs> But the, the song is really significant for a number of reasons. One is exactly this question of the cusp or, or being on the verge, right? And I think that the to be that the song announces is aspirational, yeah, right? Yeah. It's not only identifying that you are currently young, gifted, and black, but it's announcing that you will continue to be in all of the ways in which you will evolve and change and become that which you choose to be. And so I think being written in 1969, right, post-civil rights, formal civil rights legislation, right, that there's still this sense of impending hopefulness, right, right, that there's still a revolution and a future to come. And I think that the song does a fabulous job of announcing that and is really significant for me also in that it's building off of the literatures and works of other Black people, right, in particular Black women, Lorraine Hansberry. So having had this anthem grow from the play, mm -hmm. posthumously released um, after Lorraine Hansberry's passing, signals to me 
not only this aspirational element, this vision, this hopefulness, but also the intimacies that Black people share, right? And, and really acknowledging the labors and work of this young woman who was taken too soon. But part of that is situated in its moment, right? This is a moment of incredible loss and mourning with the assassinations of MLK and Malcolm X, um, the civil rights workers who have been murdered, Medgar Evers, all of these moments in which black people are collectively mourning. And to have this anthem come out in 1969 and, and really rise to popularity in 1970 sets a, a, a tone for black people that our, our past is not over and our future is, is still to come. And we have the power to actually shape that and, and to make it what we want it to be. But it's also significant, I think, in its adoption by the Congress of Racial Equality, which was an organization that had recently had a radical about face in its leadership and its political philosophy, having gone from the more integrationist um, aspirations and civil rights legislation pushing aspirations of James Farmer, who was the founder of the organization, to then moving to more of a national, a militant nationalist perspective. Um, in the late 1960s, I think this anthem marked that sea change, the change from um, kind of the more, um, the more kinds of, uh, moderate, some might say, um, elements of the civil rights movement to the, the, the radicalisms that were beginning to develop and the third world consciousness that was developing in the late 1960s and early 70s. And to be ungifted and black and Nina Simone as an icon and figure right. begin to model that change and actually um, announce it globally. Uh, Shannon, when you go into the archive to work on this book? Were there any really big surprises? I mean, things that you found that you were just absolutely floored you that you just weren't expecting to find? Yeah, definitely. Um, methodologically or, or ev as far as my evidence is it's concerned. It's evidence, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, the evidence I was surprised to um, never find a recording of the Ethiopian anthem. <laughs> Um, it was surprising and frustrating, as you can imagine. Um, but I did have the sheet music for it, so that made a huge, huge difference. I actually know what it sounds like, like right. as I play it <laughs> myself. Um, I was also surprised to have learned so much about We Shall Overcome, right? That that story actually disrupted so much of what I thought I already knew about that song. But I think the, the most radical... Um, development in my research was learning so much about Paul Robeson, yeah. um, who was someone that I had been introduced to only as a college student, um, and that only through the efforts of one faculty member who had met him as a young man and made it his mission to make sure that all of the black students on my campus <laughs> at least knew who Paul Robeson was. Um, so learning so much about um, his development, his autodidacticism, um, about his performances and receptions abroad, it was a huge eye opener for me. And he's now become um, hands down unequivocally my hero um, after having done this research. We've been joined today by Professor Shana Redman, who is Assistant Professor of American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California, but not for long, because, you know, she should be tenured soon. Yes. <laughs> uh, she is a former musician and labor organizer, and of course, the author of this brand new book, Anthem, Social Movements in the Sound of Solidarity in the African Diaspora, just published by New York University Press. Thanks for joining us today, Shannon. Thank you for having me. Black lights and booze burn when I record for Watson.